Hey, Patrick. Hey, Michael J. So, Modern has had quite a bit of shakeup from the used recent sets as well. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a few sets in a row now that are pretty transparently geared with Modern on the uh, on the menu, and uh, they it has not disappointed. Yeah, not at all. So um, it, it's it's funny, even even archetypes that have been around for a long time, you know, have gotten some substantial updates. Like uh, I'm thinking Amulet Titan, for example. If you look at Will Pulliam's deck from the uh, the Star City Open last week, he came in second place. Uh, there's like a a lot of major changes to the Amulet Titan deck, and this is a deck that's been you know performing at the Pro Tour level and certainly at at lower levels of modern for years. Yeah, I mean that. So Amulet Titan is like the poster child of benefited tremendously from what has so far proven to be the most impactful card from Throne of Eldraine in modern once upon a time. Once Upon a Time has added a layer of consistency that is just out of this world. Like, uh, the fact that, that these Titan decks are able to play four Ancient Stirrings, four Once Upon a Time, four Summoner's Pact, you just have so much access to Primeval Titan as well as whatever combination of, like, like uh, making sure that you have a, a Bounce Land or uh, a non-Bounce Land, depending on what your situation <laughs> is like, you know? Um, yeah, you it's just, just such a low opportunity cost. You play like a you know zero turn or first turn free once upon a time, and just like make sure you get a Sakura Tribe Scout, right? Like that's pretty strong uh, for a deck like this. The other thing that I noticed about this deck is like when we were looking at Amulet Titan decks, I don't even, not even like a year ago, like around when War of the Spark had come out. The decks at that era, which was only a few months ago, you know, I had two, three standard sets ago were kind of turned on their ear with Karn the Great Creator, right? Like, all those green decks, the Tron decks and the Titan decks were like, oh, we're Karn the Great Creator, Mycosynth Lattice decks now. No Karn in this deck. No. No, 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 no. I think once once you're leaning into Once Upon a Time, I mean, you could play Karn. And in fact, there are some Tron decks that do play Karn that still use Once Upon a Time. But Once Upon a Time kind of makes you more about that part of the plan you know and uh the the primeval titan and karu action which actually there's a new land um castle garenbrig that really plays into the whole primeval titan i mean castle garenbrig is like when it's like tailor-made for when you want to jump straight from uh four to six castle garenbrig is uh, a rare land from throne of eldraine uh it has the ability that you can add four mana and tap it, so five total, right, to make six. Um, and that's just so happens to be uh, how much Primeval Titan costs. <laughs> right, and you can only use it to play creature spells or activate abilities of creatures, which in this deck it's almost exclusively used to play Primeval Titan. The, uh, the, the other thing, though, is that it's got the special ability that you can have it enter the battlefield tapped. All you need to do is not have a forest yet. And this is, like, powerful with Amulet of Vigor. Like, if you have multiple Amulet of Vigors, you can actually be, like, really capitalizing on the fact that, remember, this is a deck that only has a few forests. You know, you have two forests, two snow-covered forests, and then two breeding pools. That's only six forests in the whole deck. So, like, Castle Garenbrig is going to, quote, unquote, enter the battlefield tapped a fair bit of the time, which is an advantage in a deck with Amulet of Vigor uh, once you actually get the namesake. Or it's, like, at least kind of shaves off the disadvantage, right? Well, um, no, I mean, it actively becomes an advantage because once you get to a spot where you get that second amulet, you're netting mana. Oh, sure, sure. Because it... it, it uh. Yeah, you can respond to it. Um, I was actually thinking that there was another land that it's not new from Throne of Eldraine, but it's a relatively new land that is also making its home in the modern uh, Amulet Titan deck. Field of the Dead? Yeah, this guy can't get rid of it. <laughs> it's everywhere. Yeah, Field of the Dead, it's like um, a one card backup plan combo. It gives you inevitability, and it it's so much easier to pair with whatever you want than Valakit, for instance, which requires you to play with just boatloads of mountains. 
yeah, I mean, Field of the Dead, it's good. It's not as busted in this deck as it is in some spots, but it's like such a powerful, low cost uh, addition to the deck, like the whole dimension. Plus, it has that special ability of entering the battlefield tapped. So, here's the thing with Field of the Dead. So, this deck doesn't always have like seven lands in play, right? But if you've got Primeval Titan going, it's not too difficult to get seven lands in play. Uh, it does have the the special feature of having 28 lands, so it's like almost half lands. And many, or 29, like okay. uh, Zach Allen's list. And, you know, many of the lands are like, uh, you know, Karoos that are bouncing lands back up, and you've got, you've got all these abilities like with Sakura Tribe Scout or Azusa Lost But Seeking, which allows you to play multiple lands per turn. So that's kind of a cool kind of a cool little thing that you can do there where you're just like pumping out like two or three two twos per turn with field of the dead like even without yeah online. without even needing to play spells right without even playing any spells if you just play your crew and then use the circuit travel scout to play it again each time bouncing a crew then uh you can make two two twos a turn that way without even playing any spells yeah i think that that's like a really powerful kind of backup grindy plan so or if you got a zuza yeah. Man, so, you just get get lost in it. Do you think that, just positionally speaking, relative to other decks that you can play in modern, or even relative to itself prior to Throne of Eldraine, do you think an Amulet Titan has just gotten to be like a better deck, like a deck with a greater win expectation, or is it just like it has more features? Well, I think that first of all, first and foremost, uh, with Faithless Looting out of the way, like I think you just you don't have to, like, some of the big fish, I mean, the, the Hogak stuff was just busted for a while. And then Faithless Looting was so powerful, both in Dredge and then also in Phoenix decks. And with all that stuff kind of, like, tempered down a bit, combined with Amulet Titan just making extraordinary use of Once Upon a Time, I think, I think this is one of the defining decks of the format now. Like it's it, just you know like you know Amulet Titan's always been one of the most explosive decks. Yeah, but absolutely. it's but it's so prone to drawing its cards in the wrong order. Like it's well, like, it's got a super once high upon a time helps. Yes, but like stuff can go. It, your ceiling can be to the right or the left or straight down sometimes with this deck, right? I think that's <laughs> kind of the criticism of it. But like between the new Mulligan rule. And once upon a time, on top of Ancient Stirrings, I think it's just, this deck is, I think I think this is one of the defining decks of the format at this point. Um, Zach Allen actually had another Throne of Eldraine card that, uh, curious your thoughts on if it warrants inclusion in the deck. He's got two copies of Oko, Thief of Crowns, in his sideboard. Oh, I don't know. Oko's so good. Uh, I'd say a couple things. Number one, with Sakura Tribe Scout, even if you don't have, like, an unfair draw... You can play Oko fast, right? So you can play like a first turn Sakura Tribe Scout, you know, and then just drop like a, a regular land and, and cast it on turn two, like you would with like a regular land or L for Birds of Paradise or Noble Hierarch or whatever. So that as a potential plan is just kind of quick. Um, I don't know. Uh, the three casting cost Planeswalkers from recent sets, right? Or two or three casting cost Planeswalkers from recent sets. Ren and Six, Teferi Time Reveler. Even Narset, even Ashiok have all found homes, have, have been able to, to perform at high, high rates in, in modern. And I, I think Oko is on par, at least with those cards. Like, you know, I think there's a question as to who's the stronger three-mana Planeswalker in standard right now between Oko and Teferi. And I feel like Oko's clawing up there. If, people, if there's not a consensus, you know, people are like, oh, Oko's pretty good. I don't see why I wouldn't be able to do that in, in modern. Uh, plus, there's a lot of artifacts in modern that you might want to transform into a three three to solve the problem. <laughs> That's and uh, Oko, I mean, people play lava spike decks. There's a couple of jokers out there. Yeah, I don't. You know start making food, food every turn. You start making food every turn. What in the world is a lava spike deck going to do if you get to untap with an Oko? Well, first of all, they can't really kill it. <laughs> I've learned that the hard. No, way I mean like, you, but you could kill them. Because you don't get to really? untap with an Oko until turn four. So if somebody's got... What if the burn deck is on the play? Okay, if you've got Oko Thief of Crowns, right, implication is you have three mana. 
you make a food. Next turn, you make another food. You didn't kill Oko yet. I mean, the, like... No, 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 you're already are... dead. You're already dead. Just you don't like... think a Lava Spike deck is going to occasionally be able to win on turn four? Oh, sure. It can win on turn three sometimes. It's not real. Common. Exactly. That's, that's the part I'm saying. That's how you get them to not be able to untap with an Oko. Just got to sure get they it. die. You got to go off. Like, if they play Oko and make some food, time to go off. Like, that's the turn. You got to end it. So here's the beautiful man, thing. man, is it not getting better for you? About playing the Lava Spike deck, Patrick. The cards that you drew, those are your cards. If it says it's time <laughs> to go off, it's time to go off. Um, you know, we, 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 don't have, we don't have any of these, like, brainstorms. We don't fix our draw. The closest thing we do to fixing our draw is if we play with cards like Light Up the Stage, maybe. Or if we play with, uh, you know, Horizon Canopy type lands. Crack your baked canyon, half baked canyon. I mean, that's t- I mean that's tough, man. Uh, you you just play what you draw. Sometimes your draw ends up to twenty. I'm looking at Zach's deck. In addition to having twenty nine lands in his main deck, and this isn't like a this isn't like a or more. A, a wish deck. Radiant Fountain, Ghost Quarter Fielder, then Cavern of Souls, all on the sideboard. Who needs yeah. that many lands in the sideboard? Dude, you board in the right lands at the right time because this really is a deck that does so much tutoring. Right, like this is a deck with Tolaria Wests, Vesuva to copy stuff you tutor up, Ancient Stirrings to tutor for land or to tutor for Primeval Titan, or not Titan, but to, to tutor for the land you need, and Primeval Titan to go fetch up more of whatever lands that you want to have that are awesome. Plus, people destroy some of your land, man. You need to have some more land. Do you think you're siding out lands when you're siding in these lands? You're just going to mix it up yeah. like... Yeah, because some of them are the wrong kind. Like, I don't, I don't need Castle Gear. Yeah, like, for instance, do you think... Let me ask, okay, how about this, man? How about this, man? Well, Castle Gear Burn is green. How about this? How many matchups do you think you're going to leave one Radiant Fountain in the deck and one in the sideboard? You think one is the right number of Radiant Fountains and not just the hedge that you start with? Yeah, so it's like, it's zero or two, right? <laughs> exactly. You don't need the one-one split. You either want to or you don't. The same is true with Cavern of Souls. You don't need both to be split. You're either going to want them or break them up. Yeah, so if you're playing against, like, Azorius Control, you're going to want Cavern of Souls over Radiant Fountain, like, a million percent of the time. Right, exactly. Like, who cares if I gained a small amount of life? Right. And if field, same thing, if Field of the Dead or Ghost Quarter are good, the second one is good also. You, it's all four of those are important for customizing, giving you a second look at each of them. Field of the Dead, it's important to not be able to, like, you don't want to just have the first one getting destroyed cold you. And you get with Ghost Quarter, the second one is important because they're playing Tron or something, <laughs> right? So, like, it's okay to just go up to two against the people where you want it. And against the people where you don't want it, you don't want it. It's just a colorless land. Get a land that does something, like Cavern of Souls or whatever. Yeah. This is, uh, I don't think I've ever seen a sideboard like, I mean, I've probably seen a sideboard like this, but I just, I can't mentally remember registering. Some of the 42, some of the, some of these 37 and 42 land decks They've been known to sideboard four or five lands. <laughs> Seriously. Sometimes you just got to, like, mix it up, up you know? Uh, yeah. Not, it, look, it makes sideboard. sense. Sideboard. Oh, I got, I, got, I got another Maze of Ith and another Tabernacle, a Glacial Chasm. They don't even make any mana. <laughs> They're just land. Get the Adventurer's Guild House in there. Uh, <laughs> you finally hit one. I don't know what it does. <laughs> Is that one from Homeland? Dude. No, man, that's from Legends. Yeah, I really don't know what it is. That's does. a nice one. No, nah, man, do you ever just bands with other? No, never done that. You can have your, dude, with Adventures Guildhouse, you can have your Green Legends game bands with other Legends. Do they have to be Green Legends? Dude, it's, your, the Green Legends have to be, uh, with the Legends that gain bands with other Legends have to be green. But then they can band with, like, any legend. Any legendary creature can attack in a band as long as at least one 
has bands with other legendary creatures. Bands are blocked as a group. If at least two legendary creatures you control, one of which has bands with legendary creatures, are blocking or being blocked by the same creature, you divide that creature's combat damage, not its controller, among any of the creatures it's being blocked by or is blocking. It's pretty simple, really. Yeah, so this is a mechanic that only works if somebody's blocking, right? Well, no, you yeah, you could be blocking or they could be blocking. So... Uh, you mentioned a card earlier, Faithless Looting, <laughs> that is no longer in the format. And yet, in eighth place, we still see a dredge deck making the top eight. Alex Zorowski with uh, kind of a, a take on classic dredge, right? With no Faithless Looting. Well, uh, it's got the, it's, it's got, you know, the poor peasant's version of Faithless Looting, he's, Merchant he's of the Veil. Vale. Going on an adventure. Only three, though. So Merchant of the well, Veil is, powerful. Is, a, is a new adv- adventuresome human peasant. It's a 2 and an R for a 2-3. That's a pretty interesting ability, though. Like You can pay 2 and an R once it's already on the battlefield, and you can discard a card to draw a card. That's kind of a cool ability to have over the course of... It's pretty of- pricey for a format like Modern. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a thing you might want to do. It's in the range. But I don't think that yep. that's really the main thing you're doing um, with this card. It has also Haggle. So it's front side adventure. Haggle is an instant. That is a, a a card you can pay for R. And it says you may discard a card if you do draw a card. This is not a powerful spell on the front side at all. Well, in this deck, the powerful part is that you can just go turn one Haggle. And then immediately discard Stinkweed Imp and then replace the draw with Stinkweed Imp Dredging. And now you just have five cards already in your graveyard. You're already on your way. And it's not like you lost the Merchant of the Veil. You still have the Dorky 2-3, you know, the Hurley Minotaur or whatever to come later. Yeah. But it's like a way to really jumpstart whatever, whether it's Bloodgast or Golgari Thug or Stinkweed Imp or Prize Amalgam. Mostly, though, what you want to do is discard Stinkweed Imp or Golgari Thug and just get your Dredge on. You can do Loam, too, if you if you really want. But it's mostly just about jumpstarting with Dredge because this is a deck that's very turbo about trying to get the Dredge on because it's using Shriekhorn and uh, really trying to just cycle through the deck as quick as possible, put a little bit of beat down on your opponent, and creeping chill them into next Tuesday so, so that you can finally kill them with Conflagrate. Yeah, so Shriekhorn and um, Merchant of the Veil are kind of like minus cards. But if you're dumping cards in your graveyard, sometimes it's, um, it's Creeping Chill, which is obviously essentially a free Lightning Helix, which is great. Um, but also you're just putting put yourself in a position where you can start recouping Resources with life from the loam. You're just incidentally going to get creatures in play basically for free, right? So if you're getting these blood gas or whatever, you're not actually spending any cards on them. And then, like you said, after you get somebody with a couple of chills, you get in a couple of chip shots with your small guys. A cathar- I'm sorry, a conflagrate. It was probably also in your graveyard. Probably fueled by life from the loam. It's going to put them away for bigs. Yeah, part of the life from the loam thing that's uh, worth paying attention to, I mean, this deck only has three Forgotten Caves. It's not like you're just overflowing with Cycling Lands. So you can end up in spots where you just have too much land in your hand and nothing to do with it, right? Until you find that Conflagrate. And so being able to discard the extra land to either Cathartic Reunion or Merchant of the Veil is like an important part of the deck keeping, you know, just cycling through, keeping the flow. Absolutely. Um, I was just, uh, you know, I was a little tickled. You said you thought the Dredge was going to be Tier 1 even after they banned uh, its key card, and it looks like you might have been right on that one. Yeah. Plus, how can I know that like Urza is just going to show up? And But despite all that, still uh, Dredge putting up uh, you know hits. So, Fifth and eighth place, you know? So let's speak about Urza for a second. So there was a Wurza deck before, and that was like a big hit, and that was... I, but actually, before we jump off the, the Dredge thing real quick, though, I did want to note that fifth place, Michael Hernandez did play the full four Merchant of the Veils. You know, so it's not like it's automatically right to be shaving that. Anyway, keep... Yeah, so uh, two new versions of Urza decks have come out very very recently, the last couple of weeks. So we're, we've seen Wurza decks for a while. We've seen these decks that were generating 
Tons and Sons of Life, we're putting together a sword combo. But I thought we'd start with uh, 24th place in the open, the grand champion, Autumn Burchett, with Urza Outcome. And then there's even like a next level past Urza Outcome, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the Urza Outcome deck is is really, really important. I mean, uh I mean, is there? Do you particularly want to look at that one instead of like Oliver's top uh, top eight list? Well, I thought we'd start with Urza outcome, right? Like Autumn's deck, right? And then, and then jump. Well, over no, no, no. To like, oh no, 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 they're the same deck. Urza, okay. No, it, Oliver's deck is there's ascendancy. It's an It's a four. It's got four paradoxical outcome, man. It's the same deck. Well, yeah. Well, it has that, but then the ascendancy deck has. Even an additional push, that's what I'm thinking. I see. So the, you're just saying because of this outcome deck is, like, missing the ascendancy portion? Well, I, mean, I, I thought let's talk about the just the core and sure, sure, the outcome sure, deck sure. and then talk about how it kind of what, what okay. the ascendancy All deck right. offers on top of it. All right. So uh, this list is basically an ascendancy deck without any ascendancies in it. <laughs> it's got a bunch of zeros, like uh, Mox Opal, Mox Amber... Uh, Mishra's Bobble. It makes it so that when you draw Jeskai Ascendancy, when you realize to put it in your deck, you can like get lots of untaps for your Emery. But uh, in this deck, mainly all you're doing is dropping as many things as possible so that when you Paradoxical Outcome, you can draw as many things. Each zero is like another cantrip. So the main difference is like the Urza Outcome deck you can just gain a big advantage, right? Like, that's basically what the deck does. It lets you, like, draw a bunch of cards and deploy a bunch of, like, cheap artifacts, potentially get a bunch of, um, you know, triggers or whatnot, or, you know, some kind of token profitability because... with, with Sai or Urza uh, or Sahili, right? And then you say go, and hopefully you win. And the difference... With... No, 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 no. What do you mean you oh, say go and hopefully you win? You drop Mirrod and Besieged and you choose Phyrexian. Oh, well. And then they die. That'll get them. Yeah, you, besides, you also have Grinding Station. Like, every time you... If you Paradoxical Outcome and you have Grinding Station, you'll mill their whole deck. So, like, this is definitely a deck that can combo. All I'm saying is that it's 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 uh, it might be better. I don't know, but it's a little more focused on a fewer number of combos. I just happen to think that the Jeff's guy ascendancy portion is too good to pass on. Yeah, I, you know, I like, agree. I mean, Emery in this deck is a one cost ridiculous. It's like the most absurd goblin welder ever. You know, like you get to mill yourself also, and then you also <laughs> don't even have to lose an artifact. You just get to play artifacts out of your graveyard for no reason so let, let's talk about this like in a real simple combination right so let's say you have emery emery because potentially one mana in this deck because you have so many cheap artifacts right and it normally costs three but it could cost as, as little as you uh, it's gonna always cause you in this deck this deck has so many zeros and emery has the ability uh tap choose target artifact in your graveyard you may cast that card this turn. Now, if you have Jeskai Ascendancy in play, right? So Jeskai Ascendancy uh, costs the Jeskai mana, blue, red, white, for an enchantment. It says, whenever you cast a non-creature spell, creatures you can go control get plus one, plus one until end of turn. Untap those creatures. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, you may draw a card. If you do, discard a card. So if you just have any zero in your graveyard for example oh i don't know a mishra's bauble you can say emery can say hey i'd like to play you right and then tap to to say that play the mishra's bauble trigger the jeskai ascendancy untap uh emery sacrifice the bauble right and notably emery getting a plus one plus one so basically you just do this a bunch of times uh Set yourself up with a, essentially a perfect hand, right? Because Mistress Bobble uh, doing this over and over again is allowing you to loot. And you're also stockpiling future draws that are never going to happen because the game's going to be over. Yeah, remember, it's not it's not even about the Bobble looking or anything. It's just the fact that Jeskai Ascendancy lets you loot as many times as you want. And it's, it's zero, right? So it's zero and it goes to the graveyard. So Emery can keep turning the Bobble back on, right? So you just like play it, play it, play it. Emery keeps on tapping. Emery keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. 
if you're fixing your hand, or, you fix your hand, you can get them. Well, plus, if you ever get a mox, you have infinite mana. Because each time you play one of these legendary moxes, like you play mox amber, you you know, you know tap your mox amber, you get a mana, you play a different mox amber, and then uh, legend rule, the first one goes away, the second one you can now tap for a mana. So every mox amber and every mox opal can be used if you get two of them. You know, like if you have two Mox Amber or two Mox Opal, you have infinite mana as well. And if you're looting through your whole deck, you're going to be able to find it. And then you can eventually just, uh, when you have infinite mana, it's trivial to do something else. You know, like for instance, if you find Paradoxical Outcome, then you can draw tons of cards. Or if you play Urza, you can Urza all your cards. You know, you just do whatever. But really, would you end? You eventually just find Mirrored and Besiege, and you kill them with that. So this card is a two and a U uh, enchantment, and it has two modes: Mirin and Phyrexian. And you pick one of them, right? If you pick Mirin, whenever you cast an artifact spell, create a one-one colorless Mirror artifact creature token. In this deck, like we said, you can you can play the same Bauble or Mox over and over and over again, so you can make a gigantic army. It's kind of an extra stop. Or, but also, even with Paradoxical Outcome. You just get to make a ton. Like you play all your zeros, and now you have a huge army to win with, like a goblin, uh, you know, empty the warrens. But also, alternatively, if you could have all these one ones, and then you, uh, you know, you just run them over because Jeskai Ascendancy buffing all the one one tokens is like you're going to kill them so fast. Sure. I mean, you probably have like infinity of them anyway. Well, sometimes you have an infinite. I'm saying even if you're on the backup plan, Mirror and Besiege is good. Uh, but Phyrexian, it is like a seat. Phyrexian's the big payoff, right? So Phyrexian is how you win when things are going well. <laughs> so Phyrexian has the text, at the beginning of your end step, draw a card, then discard a card. If there are 15 or more artifact cards in your graveyard, target opponent loses the game. I suggest selecting the opponent that you've got that game. Yeah, but if you're playing multiplayer, you can just kill one per turn. Yeah. Um, so I think that... Uh, Urza Ascendancy is going to completely displace uh, Urza Outcome in the same way that, like, the like the double combo Cephalid Breakfast deck um, displaced the Life deck. Yeah, I don't know. I just think that the same deck. It's just that, obviously, if you just play... I think the Jeskai Ascendancy is so clearly just... It's still a paradoxical outcome deck, but it's just that it uses all the same engine thing to play Jeskai Ascendancy. A little harder to cast. Yeah, I guess. I mean, deck seems sick. Oh yeah, I think it's but, it's very exciting. Um, but here we see uh, one in top eight, one in top, uh, finishing just outside the top eight at tenth place. Um, definitely uh, strong strategy. But there are. Uh, wait, I mean, out of curiosity, what do you think of um, Urza Ascendancy versus Amulet Titan? Wow. Uh, I think that... I think it just straight up, I like Amulet Titan. Um, I think Amulet Titan's faster, uh, just head-to-head. Uh, is that the question you're asking? Uh, which, well, which one do you think is a stronger deck in the format? Uh, I mean, all other things held equal, I think that I'd play the Urza deck against the field if they're up against each other i think i like the amulet deck see i think i actually well i i i think i might enjoy the urza deck more i think they're both fantastic i think the urza deck is incredible um i think that the urza deck is a little more see i don't think that the titan deck is faster i think the urza deck is breathtakingly fast like i think that you can just kill on turn two it's just, I think that the Urza Ascendancy deck is a lot more vulnerable to interaction. I think this Amulet Titan deck, it's kind of soulless and crushing and very, 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 very robust. So I think that the Amulet Titan, weirdly, I think that the Amulet Titan deck has somehow gotten to a spot where it's the resilient combo deck. Yeah, I mean, it has this whole Field of the Dead thing going. Like, all you have to do is find the Field of the Dead. You'll eventually get them, right? Isn't that isn't that part of its its strategy? You also just eventually get them if you just play out your land. I mean, you just... The deck has a lot of tutors, yeah. you know? Plus, 
you know, you can eventually find Primeval Titan and win. I like the 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 Primeval Titan triggering to get Teleria West and like any Karoo, and then the Karoo bounces the Teleria West, so that you can just tutor for your zeros. Like you can tutor for engineered explosives, or you can tutor for Pact of Negation. Mm-hmm. I think that's like well, that's one of the big big draws of the Amulet Titan deck, right? Like you're winning. You haven't won yet, but you have a Pact of Negation in your hand. It's going to be awfully difficult for the opponent to fight through that. So, did you see this new take on uh, devo- like Vizier of Remedies Devoted Druid? Holden Wolf's deck makes such good use of Once Upon a Time that this is a list that's almost becoming something different. Like... So this is a, one of those devoted druid Vizier of Remedy decks, but not even really bothering with, like, Vizera Seer or any of that stuff. It's like, it's a Celestia deck through and through. You know, post-mortem lunge, be accepted. But, like, it's uh, between four Eldar uh, Armory's Calls, four Once Upon a Time, three Eldritch Evolution, four Finale of Devastation, a Ranger Captain of Eos. This is a deck that's, like, all tutors. Right, and all you have to do is assemble devoted druid vizier of remedies, and uh, you've got so many outlets because this deck is so reliably able to find the combo so quick and so repeatedly. It actually uses way more victory conditions than you would normally use because you want to already have one in your hand so that you can just win immediately. And here you have Chalet, Voice of Plenty, uh, Walking Ballista. Ranger Captain of Eos can find Walking Ballista. Uh, Finale of Devastation is obviously a game. You know, like Eldritch Evolution can find Ranger Captain of Eos so that you can find Walking Ballista. So it's, I mean, this deck is, this deck is all about uh, getting infinite mana and then winning with it, incidentally. And then obviously Postmortem Lunge gives you such a way to just play through any sort of removal spell. You don't even need to get the infinite mana to win a lot of the time. Like, a lot of these sideboard cards, if you just use one of your tutors, like, you just call for the particular thing or, you know. Dude, you're just paralyzed. You're looking at that Forge Tender, and you're just so uh, shaken. I've beaten a Forge Tender out of this strategy in my life. I'm not saying you haven't. I'm I'm just saying saying you're going to spend the infinite mana. I mean... Who, well, who's worse off, me against one Forge Tender or certain decks against one Collector Oof? I mean, that that Oof is a problem. Also, I think the Forge Tender might be less of a problem than the three core Firewalkers that he's hanging out with in this sideboard. That's a, <laughs> kind of a collection of uh, madcap jerks. Um, also, Gaddick Teague. Some people can't beat Gaddick Teague. Big Daddy Gaddy. I'm just saying, shout like... Shout out play, to Kerber Holes. One or two casting cost uh, accelerators, and then you just throw out your finale of devastation. You don't you don't have to work real hard. <laughs> the, the deck will be like, Ugh, I'm just sitting back now. I have plenty of time to figure out how I'm going to win. So, which Celestine deck do you like better, that one or the Eldrazi deck that Tan played? Oh my god! Um, so this is uh, once upon a time in order to find Eldrazi. You know, and to say nothing of Stoneforge Mystic or uh, Eldrazi Displacer, Thought Not Seer. You know, this is this here. See, everybody was like, oh, Stoneforge Mystic. Man, I sure hope we play Stoneforge Mystic with, you know, counter spells and four cost planeswalkers like the good old days. Or, or Stoneforge Mystic will sell out and work for the Eldrazi because you can't risk. Messing up a billion dollar industry, you know? <laughs> um, I think I like the uh, the combo Selesnia deck more, but man, I think this deck is good too. It's very exciting to me. So this deck, like obviously we're never going to get back to the point where Eldrazi had all those double lands and we're just utterly dominating that one person. Well, sort of. I mean, you've got four Eldrazi Temple... Four ancient stirring, four once upon a time. Well, and the thing you're, is, you're going to draw two, kind of. This sex has got hierarchs and birds of paradise to make up for the fact that it doesn't have all those doubles, right? So that's where it's getting some of its acceleration. Uh, like you just said, the once upon a time is quite different in modern, quite different in one of these strategies than it is in 
in standard if you're used to playing against it there. And yeah, I mean, you're just going to consistently have Stoneforge Mystic if that's what you want, right? Um, Mystic's just setting up whatever you want here, right? Like, you just go get Sword of Feast and Fam and stick it on a Reality Smasher. Who beats that? Well, apparently Vizier of Remedies and Devoted Druid if you're leaning the other way. Um, well, yeah, I mean, look, this deck, this deck can get a huge advantage quickly, uh, but it doesn't necessarily win the game immediately, right? So you still need two or three hits, even if you have, like, your big, big stuff going. Um, and, you know, the other Celestine deck could just kill you. I guess you could Displace people, depending. Displacer is a strong card. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so as far as Once Upon a Time decks go, what did you think of the Death Shadow? Also a Once Upon a Time deck, man. Well, uh, the cutest thing about it has got to be that uh, uh, Gore, uh, Gore Clan Rampager. Got, well, got that's, that, that, that one's... Of. No, but that's always been about the traverse the Elven Wild to go get it, you know. Um, yeah, I still thought it was the cutest part. So obviously, uh, once upon a time is only a two of in this deck. Uh, your point being that there are four traverses that change things up a lot relative to uh, other once upon a time decks we've looked at. Um, I've always appreciated the fact that these decks play like a tar fire, right? There's like no lightning bolt here. <laughs> Dude, you gotta make you gotta make Tarmac life bigger. Yeah, it's, it's also or traverse. alternatively, really, it's about traverse. It's yeah. traverse is the real thing. So you know, it's a it's a goblin as well as a as an instant. Um, so it does make Tarmac life bigger. A tribal, yeah, tribal. It gives you a, an extra type of uh, card in your graveyard for, for traverse. Uh, I don't know. I think like this strategy is it's always been good. I mean, I don't know why it's so much better than it was at any other point. It's less well, exciting I mean, as some of these other new decks is what I mean. Yeah, it's not as crazy, but I mean, there's a different Jun deck, though, that, that does some sweet stuff. Anthony Nazaro's... Uh, so, obviously, the collection of Tarmogoyf, Bloodbraid Elf, Lightning Bolt, Liliana of the Veil, and Rena si- and Six. Yeah, we've seen those. This is some powerful cards, right? Dude, you can call against command to get back the Bone Crusher Giant. Um, that is very, very flexible, right? The, the Bone Crusher Giant has to be in the graveyard to call against command it back. Right? Well, yeah, yeah, but no, but eventually you do that. I'm yeah. just saying that, like, later in the game, you've got uh, a shock that you could actually call against command back. So that way, you can kill something that does four. Yeah, that would be. Uh, I guess that's the thing you can do. It seems it seems like a real difficult way to do it to me. Dude, I'm trying to figure out why you want to play one of these decks instead of like an Urza deck or a uh, Amulet deck. But I, I think that there's what else, reasons. right? So this deck has three Inquisition Kozilek and three Thoughtseize because I suppose it had to make room for these Bone Crusher Giants and Goblin Rabble Masters. Uh, but you have some early game disruption lead into Ren and Six. And then you've got like this Ren and Six Liliana the Veil thing going. That's pretty cool. Um, this deck is like inherently resilient to some of the strategies that people will bring to bear just because it has Ren and Six, right? So you know if if somebody is is one of these decks that's playing like a lot of land destruction, like they've got Ghost Quarters and they've got Fields stuff like that, like you can just keep pace with them. Um, that's not maybe center of the, the metagame right this second, but there's certainly been times, uh, we've looked at multiple decks that play at least some of those lands, uh, and you've got a really heck of a card advantage engine just between those two cards, and then you just go into Bloodbraid Elf, I mean, Bone Crusher Giant's a two for one, right, Colgan's Command's a two for one, this is really like the realization of the promise of Jund, which is that all their stuff is, on a, on a per card basis, is like individually doing a little more work than the cards that most other people are playing. But yeah, I agree. It's not nearly as powerful as, <laughs> as the decks we were looking at before. Mm, yeah, I mean, true. Uh, actually, dude, here's one that's a little off the radar. But uh, what do you think about uh, the Golgara Yogmoth deck? Like Aiden uh, Rumpsmith played a build of it 
to a top 64 finish, this one's a little raw and maybe there's room to improve it. But the idea is that you put down Yawgmoth, Thran Physician, right? And then uh, you've got uh, some undying creatures like Young Wolf, Strangle Root Geist, and Giroff's Messenger. So if you can find uh, – if you can get two undying creatures while you have Yawgmoth, you can pay a life and sacrifice an undying creature to put a minus one, minus one counter – on uh, one of your other creatures, such as, for instance, let's say that you already had an undying creature with a plus one, plus one counter on it, right? So you sacrifice your young wolf, you'll shrink your other young wolf, and your young wolf will come back, the one you sacrifice will come back as a 2-2, and you'll draw a card. So it's like you bargained. But then you can sacrifice the other one now, and so basically it's a loop. Anyway, any, the point is that if you have two, uh, any two undying creatures, then Yawgmoth Thran Physician is Yawgmoth's bargain. Hmm. What are we going to do with all these cards we're drawing? A value. Just get, just get more. Get more, <laughs> more young wolves. <laughs> I'm like, I'm waiting for, I'm waiting for the punchline. Well, we're going to get our Academy Rector. <laughs> We're going to sacrifice it. We're going to go get all their permanents. And I mean, you can eventually... There. No, I mean, you do win. No, you do win because you eventually... You see, if you just bargain a bunch, you can get Blood Artist or Court of Calling for Blood Artist or Eldritch Evolution for Blood Artist. Because once you have a Blood Artist in play, then you it's infinite because every time you bargain, you don't lose any life, your opponent does. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, so you do win immediately. Look, if you get the messenger, also, right? Like that'll that'll speed it up things a little bit. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you get the messenger involved, that you know, it doesn't take much. Uh, that is that is a cool combo, though. Um, does it have? Okay, so why would you play this deck instead of the Selesnya version? That because you fancy, really just fanciness. Like if you do this version, you get to be vulnerable to graveyard hate. And you're a little bit slower, but but you have less tutors, so you're less consistent. Yeah, uh, your cards are also However, a bit more expensive, you, and your cards are worse. Like Young Wolf is not as powerful as El Dalmeri's Call. Yeah, I'm saying like Yagma Transposition is literally four mana. <laughs> your deck can, your deck just has two forests, three Calony Gardens, four Geralt's Messenger. I repeat my question. <laughs> Why would we play this set of... The, the Selesnya version seems so much better than this to me, so I think that you think... This one is sweet. It's fancy. Yeah, it's it's sweet. I think it's also a little less good at getting them. Like, you, you need to put a little <laughs> more work into getting them to get there. Dude, what is going on with Sam Black's deck? Uh, he finished just outside the top 64. He's playing, I can only assume, take on control. So he's got, uh, uh, for counter spells, a force of negation, a spell snare, a deprive, three cryptic commands, four drown in the lock, which is also part of his removal package, four drown in the lock, lock four fatal push, an abrupt decay, two assassins trophies. Somehow he just shows up playing eleven removal spells in modern. Well, he's got one Arkham's Astrolabe and two Pulse of Marasa in his main deck, also. <laughs> and he's got like, Dude, this, what is going on? He's got all the Snapcaster Mages. He couldn't. You know how a normal person stops at like two Snapcaster Mages? Sometimes well, he's got see, torrential gear hulk. He's got five. Three. He's got five. Yeah. One of them costs Dude. six mana. And then he's just, like, thought-scouring his opponent. <laughs> Is he? Yeah. So that, I mean... His deck is built around turning yeah. on Into the Story. So Into the Story is five blue-blue for an instant. It's an instant that draws four cards. So normally it's an, inst- it's an opportunity for one mana more, but 
if your opponent has seven or more cards in their graveyard, then it's an opportunity for two mana less. So you start fatal. See, part of it is you want to thought scare your opponent anyway, because you're playing drown in the lock. Yeah, that's that's the part that so I saw. So once quickly. you turn on drown in the lock, drown in the lock becomes terminate counterspell. Really, like if you thought scour your opponent a single time, drown in the lock is is counterspell uh, terminate. It's beating up most of the stuff that people actually play in the format, right? And then if you actually uh, can reliably play, uh, you know, into the story for four to draw four cards, that is a much better factor fiction. You know, and your opponent doesn't want to play into your cryptic command anyway, so you just brutalize them by drawing four cards and running away with it. Yeah, I mean, even if I have into the story online the way that I want it to be online, like four mana draw four cards in modern is it, that's not singing to me. That's not like oh, I would play oh, that. Jay, that's how we win the tournament, dude. I would play four mana draw four. Dude, that's so sweet. If you play four mana draw four, your ability to find like Urza or Primeval Titan would be so good. What about your ability to find mid range creatures that like can be <laughs> can be easily killed? Dude, this deck needs pernicious, dude. That's what this deck needs. Well, I mean, oh, I guess he's got Pulse of Marasa. Oh yeah. So it's not that bad. Like, so all of his guys no! are super easy to kill. Oh, yeah. Including Torrential Gear Hulk, because this is this is modern, so people are like killing it with value all the time. Um, but he can pulse them back, so he's like gaining a little bit also. So his pulse is uh, what green cards he is? Abrupt Decay, Assassin's Trophy. Well, dude, Hulk. the combo Torrential Gear Hulk with Pulse and Marasa is. Why is that good? What do you mean? What are you pulsing? You've won Torrential Gear Hulk. You pulse the Torrential Gear Hulk. Oh, I see. I thought you were intimating I cast Red Gear Hulk to trigger it for pulse. <laughs> you you can do that too, and then get like a Snapcaster Mage or a land. Yeah. Uh Dude, lands are really good. Remember, this is just a Mystic Sanctuary deck. Oh. The point of this deck, that's the whole point. Once you get going, you're just gonna Mystic Sanctuary, and then you can just find nothing but cryptic commands. Because you can just if you like once you get going. You can draw Pulse of Marasa or Cryptic Command or Drown in the Lock every turn. How is your opponent beating you if you draw Drown in the Lock, Cryptic Command, or Pulse of Marasa every turn? Um, Boseju who shelters all. <laughs> okay, dude. <laughs> hey, you asked how. Dude, uh, this is a great spot for you to go on the sideboard. I like that. Yeah, so this is like all the nonsense green sideboard cards, Weather the Storm and Oko. Dude, did you see the the Lucis Goose also playing Oko. Jared Ferris's five color Niv Mizzet deck, uh, you know, sneaking in at 108th place. But this deck, dude, dude, four Gilded Goose to help support your Niv Mizzet Reborn plan. You know, this is one of those bring to light Niv Mizzet Reborn decks that is, it like Niv Mizzets so hard. And then you've got one Abrupt Decay, one Eldrami, uh, Elda Amory's Call, one Kaya's Guile, one Culligan's Command, one Deafening Clarion, one Supreme Verdict, one Unmoored Ego, one Huntmaster of the Fells. Dude, this deck's got one of every gold card you could ever want. I mean, he's just going to the, to the Guild Pack Guild Hall, right? He's just like, whatever you've got, put one in my hand. Put- one call against command. It's got everything. Well, he wants four lightning helix. That one he'll play four of. But, uh, dude, this deck is so sick. The one thing I wonder about, though, is what do you think of these Felidar Guardians? Well, there's so he, Sahili Rai. There is Sahili Rai, and you can find Sahili Rai pretty easily. But, like, Felidar Guardian, when it's not blinking Sahili Rai, you can blink Niv Mizzet Reborn. And you can bring to light. And go out our guardian Sahili Rai combo. That's pretty sweet. I think. I mean, that part of the deck seems pretty powerful to me, right? Like if somebody just taps yeah. out on turn three, you just kill them. You've got some pretty good stuff to get with Bring to Light too. Like for instance, after sideboarding, you can go find your fracturing gust, which incidentally, uh, you know, Niv Mizzet could go find also. 
Or you could go find Karanos, God of Storms, if you're on that kind of a game oh. plan. This deck has insane sideboard cards. Yes, it does, dude. And you have four Pillar of the Peruns to help power your deck. The only thing I don't like about this, it's got like Cinder Vines and Dovin's Veto in the sideboard, right? But there's like one Cinder Vines and two Dovin's Veto because the deck has to make room for all like the other nonsense cards. So it's like you can't just go hard in the direction of some awesome card that you might actually want to just draw naturally and not get only with Niv Mizzet. Dude, you can also bring to light any of this stuff. Yeah, that's like or, super expensive. Like, if you're playing against a combo deck, don't you just want to have Cinder Vines in your opening hand? I mean, y- yeah. Like, <laughs> if only one. Like, I, I need to wait five turns to cast it, is what you're saying. Dude, I love how much you love Cinder Vines. It's gross. I love it. it I up, love it. It beats up the bad people. Uh, combo. Yeah. Combo's in this sideboard. That's a nonsense card. What's with all these people with like all their like Knight of Autumn and Combo and Weather the Storm and Oko? Like, do they not want Modern to be a fun format? Well, I think that the, they they make it a little bit more fun of a format, but being out there keeping people slightly honest adjacent. Um, Noah Miller's top sixteen humans list has an interesting evolution for the archetype. Uh, charming prince in conjunction. You know, like how um, a lot of the legacy taxes decks have used Flicker Wisp off of Aether Vial to blink some of their guys at instant speed. Well, in this deck, you can actually do that at instant speed on Tribe with Charming Prince and its ability to exile another target creature you own, return to the battlefield under your uh, control. Um, so you can actually respond to a removal spell by blinking it, but also Charming Prince can just be used to reset like a Thalia's Lieutenant or Reflector Mage. Cause if you just get to use Reflector Mage or Thalia's Lieutenant a second time, that's going to bury some people. Sure. Uh, you probably don't want to do this to a champion of the parish who has a bunch of tokens on it. Counters. Thanks dude. <laughs> yeah, but you might want to do it to a casting contents. <sighs> Sure, yeah. That or reset good. with Kite Sail Freebooter. Yeah, I think that like resetting with Meddling Mage also. Like Yeah. Move it around. Uh that's it. I think I think the Charming Prince is a little low power for, for modern humans. Oh uh, no. You're only saying that because Charming Prince can be used to gain three life. Um no, I actually think that that's one of its more attractive uh features. But um like this isn't Really, like Flicker Wisp does so many more things for the for the Legacy Taxes deck than just reset at instant speed off of the Nether Vial. Um, and I think like Charming Prince, maybe maybe he's good. Um, I don't know. It doesn't doesn't seem like a two two for two that has a cool one eighty seven effect. If and only if I already had a guy with one eighty seven in play. No, you can just save one of your cards with Aether Vial. It could also have a cool effect even if you just have an Aether Vial. You know, no big deal. It's not a big ask. It's, it's also not a big effect. <laughs> Keep your guy from a removal spell. All right, maybe. I guess, yeah. It's not that big of an it's effect. It's like not that good. <laughs> it's like, like, people are literally like, oh, turn two, I'm going to draw my deck. Like, oh, well, hold on a second. If you wait for me to put a counter on my Aether Vial, I might be able to blink my first turn guy. Like that that's not an impressive comeback. Like oh Dude, all these all these busted new decks and storm wins. Just give Sun Given, Goblin Archermancer, Barrel, Chief of Compliance, Storm. But it's it's not it, it also has some new cards. Okay. Right? Yeah. Like it's got two sort of disputes in the sideboard. Yeah, that's true. Which I think is a good sideboard card anyway. I think Mystical, Dis- Mystical Dispute, it's kind of nice um, having the extra option. You know, like it's it's a solid card. I like the Aria Flame being uh, reserved for the sideboard. I know a lot of people for a while were playing those main deck. And I don't think it's the right time for that main deck. So why would you play Aria Flame in the sideboard or main deck? Like what is it getting for you? Uh, it lets you uh, win. Yeah, but the deck can already win. 
Yeah, but you can win with uh, without the graveyard. Oh, so it just the, gives you some resiliency to, to anti-graveyard. Like, it's hard to grape shot somebody enough if you don't have a graveyard. You know? Because, like, grape shot's, like, cheap, efficient, reliable. As long as you pass in flames, you'll be able to win with grape shot. Aria flame is... Uh, it's a good way to be able to kill somebody outright if the game is going to go a little, a little slower to your graveyard. Right. Like, Aria Flame is quite a bit slower, but it is it dodges graveyard hate, which I think is a, is a, is a really nice dimension. Having access to both Empty the Warrens and Aria of Flame in addition to Blood Moon, because I think that the gift stack is so good game one. But you gotta pivot. You gotta you gotta switch it on them, you know? It's like flip mode. Flip mode is the greatest. So uh, uh I don't know, man. I, I don't I personally still think that the uh the Urza deck and the Urza Ascendancy deck and the Emulet Titan deck are just at a higher level of power. But I mean Yeah. I think the this is a good gift. This, as far as gift list goes, this looks like a well-tuned version. I think for me, if I'm picking on pure power, uh, I would pick one of those two decks, Amulet Titan or one of the Urza decks. But if I'm picking in real life, I'm going to go with Burn. Like, fourth <laughs> what is wrong with Ryan you? Ryan Carey came in fourth. Uh, this deck well, has new tech? nothing new <laughs> at all. Not a single new card. Oh, is the innovation that you play one fiery islet and uh, four Sunbay Canyon? Instead of two fiery islet? <laughs> yeah, because, like, you know, you only have 20 land and you got to play with, like, Inspiring Vantage if you're going to cyborg core Firewalker. There is absolutely nothing new to talk about in this deck beyond the one fiery islet. It's a breakthrough. Did you see Chucky Davis's Bant Snowblade deck? Uh, top 32, this one's Ice Fang Kotal wearing the uh, the Sword of Feast and Famine. And you've got uh, Giver of Runes to protect your Stoneforge Mystic. What do you think, man? The Spell Queller uh, with Teferi, I think, is really awesome. Um, so if you've got Teferi Time Reveler in play and you Spell Queller somebody, A, the Spell Queller is going to resolve, so there's none of that nonsense. But B, if they kill the Spell Queller, they get their spell back. Too bad! Too bad Teferi's going to lock that stuff back down. Great combo. It's very, very good. Uh, I like the mana acceleration portion of this deck. Uh, I think like... I like the re- Restoration Angel, man. Yeah, the Angel sub-theme is doing something for me. Like, you're you're angeling your spell callers, you're angeling your... The Kotal? Yeah, the your Mystic. Mystic, all this. I think this deck is a, is a player. And, I mean, Oko is, is just nonsense. Dude, what do you think of this, all these decks that are playing Lavinia, Azorius, Renegade? There's so many of them now. Presumably, people want to stop all the zeros from these Urza decks. You know, like, obviously, you can also hit stuff like Living End or whatever, but, like, I think the, the big reason for Lavinia is just how many zeros the Urza decks are playing. Do you think Lavinia is really the best way to do it, though? Like, should you be considering instead just dropping a Chalice on zero? Um, I think... Well, look, Lavinia is good for a couple reasons. One, we first saw Lavinia in that niv Misset deck, so you know, just being Azorius colors, it can it can come up as on a trigger there. Uh, so in that deck, for example, it would be just a better choice than than Chalice. But I think like I would want to play more Lavinias than just one, and the reason is Lavinia has power and toughness. Like Lavinia can carry a sword. Uh, I respect that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Dude, why doesn't anybody play Chalice of the Void, man? Um, I don't know. Just maybe they just didn't play it this week. I mean, well, if you're thinking about the Urza deck being one of the one of the big big decks in the last two weeks, or you know, ascendancy outcome, whatever you want to call it, then if you're on the if you're on the I'm going to play zero casting cost artifacts team, maybe you just want to do the proactive, exciting thing instead of the spoilery thing. 
It's like that. It's like if you think about your experience, right? Like, isn't it more fun to be the outcome deck than the guy who's like trying to stop the outcome deck? <laughs> uh, sure. But yeah. You're, like, drawing mm-hmm. your card, and you're like embrying, and you're untapping stuff, and you have tons of power. Like every single one of those things sounds like a riot to me. You're like, man, this is a party. Here go my stuff. My guys are so big. My graveyard is so active. You know, all of that's so exciting. Like, ah, excuse me, sir. I'm just going to play this Chalice of the Void for zero and hope that you don't do anything. That's, that's not fun. No one wants to do that. All right, dude. There's the, uh, the secret uh, backroom uh, Mythic Championship uh, online tournament. Um, you know, the, like, bootleg Pro Tours this weekend. What do you yeah. think is... Uh, uh, what do you think is going to get banned uh, next week on Monday? Like they called for the emergency ban, and it would be hilarious if they emergency no ban. But given that there were basically only two decks registered at the uh, Pro Tour, you think Field of the Dead might get banned, Patrick? Uh, I, I mean, that's you know, uh, a, a little bird. I hope. Um, do you think that's enough though? Do you think they're going to ban Crassus? I hope they don't ban Crassus. Crassus seems like a fine man to me. I also just bought a quad of them. It would be very upset. <laughs> I literally just bought that card. I didn't own any before. Uh, dude, what a late adopter. Yeah, like I was playing like red for like two years. <laughs> I I didn't know that you had to own all these breeding pool cards. Uh, you know what's dude. crazy? To me? Every good deck has got like breeding pool in it, right? Standard right now. Well, that's not that's not, that it's not exactly true, but uh, there's a lot of different good decks that have breeding pools. You think it's crazy? They just made Oko. Uh, it's it's not that crazy. It's it is a it is a thing that's happening. Uh, I hope yeah. they do not ban Crassus. I actually hope they don't ban Field of the Dead. I think <gasps> like, I think Standard's kind of interesting right now. I like it's not an oppressive bad guy, is it? Uh, like it's a bad I, guy. I, I would guess. See, it's it's interesting when you're theory crafting, but from uh, some amount of more recent experience, my guess is that it's not going to be that interesting of a pro tour if they don't change the cards that are legal. Because I uh, think that the people at this championship have cracked the code. You can either play blue green, or you can play Golos blue green. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I hedged and I bought the blue green deck under the bet that they were going to ban Field of the Dead. Uh, nice. But I still needed Crassus, so I hope they don't ban that one because I just bought that card. So my hope is that they they ban Field of the Dead if they ban anything. But there are other. I mean, I don't know. Is, is Esper so bad? Probably, right? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the real problem is Oko. But there's no way they're going to do anything about it. Oh, they're not going to so, do anything about Oko. It's, it's like... They're going to dance around in circles and then, may, you know... No, they're But not whatever. Gonna... Oko is not the kind of card that they'll ever ban. Oh! I don't think so. Okay. Doesn't um, matter, man. They're not going to ban I hope they don't ban it. And it probably won't be a problem. Yep. No, Field of the Dead, call it a day. Sin life didn't work so great. Tried to play dredge into jail or hate. Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase. Your core trapped in amber stasis days. Lost a lot of friends, got left behind. Had to find a way not to lose my mind. Trapped in a 